Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Next up, we have Giant from uh, Johns Hopkins. And uh, the eagle eye that you'll see, there's a, there's a foot theme uh, coming up in the next two talks. Thank you, Stuart. Random uh, so uh, I'm Giant. I'm a graduate student at uh, the Department of Computer Science at Johns Hopkins. And uh, I've changed the title of my talk slightly to reflect the content. It's, I'm going to be talking about a data storage model for environmental sensor networks. Uh, so I'm not going to be talking about schemas, uh, but general philosophies and some of our experiences. So uh, let me give you a brief introduction into our project. Our project is the Life and Your Feet project. And uh, this is a collaboration between uh, soil ecologists and computer scientists. The soil ecologists are primarily interested in studying the spatial and temporal heterogeneity of soil ecosystems. And uh, we as computer scientists are interested in delivering that data to them using a technology that is known as the wireless sensor network technology. Uh, now, a number of groups have demonstrated the use of this technology to deliver scientifically relevant data at temporal and spatial scales. Groups at Berkeley and EPFL are some of the well-known ones. So I'm sure a lot of you guys already know this technology, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, the figure here is a central figure in this technology, and uh, that's what is referred to as a moat. It's a complete unit of computing in itself in that it has a radio, uh, a finite amount of storage, uh, a microprocessor, and so on. So these things are typically deployed in harsh environments, so you need to waterproof them. And what you end up getting is something that looks like this. And uh, that is what we refer to a box. And to that, uh, attach our peripheral sensors, which collect the data. So I have a box here with me, the ones that we use. I'm just going to pass that around. So I'll collect it at the end. Uh, so. So that entire assembly is then placed into a field, uh, an area of interest where they go and collect data. And uh, these things have a radio, so they can all communicate with themselves and uh, make intelligent decisions. Uh, and periodically, they will talk to what is known as a base station. And the job of the base station is to coordinate the activities of these, these devices and uh, collect data that they've been gathering and then ship it back to some stable storage. So with that, uh, this brings me to some of our previous deployments. And uh, this was our first deployment. Uh, this was uh, pretty close to our Johns Hopkins campus. And it was more of a proof of concept kind of deployment, a pilot study. Uh, so there were a number of interesting lessons that we learned from this deployment. Uh, one of the biggest one was that this technology indeed can collect important scientific data. But at the same time, it's very crucial to periodically monitor how they are doing. So just to motivate that a little bit, uh, here's sort of an example of soil moisture that these guys collected. Uh, that's a period about two weeks. And you can see that some of them are doing well. They're responding to the environment. But this guy over here is completely dead. And uh, so we had a few examples where we didn't monitor these guys. And uh, they were out there. And uh, they were not doing what they were supposed to do. And we lost some of that data. So moving on to the next deployment, this was uh, a deployment that we did in collaboration with the Jug Bay uh, Wetland Sanctuary. And this was a very interesting deployment. The, there were two goals here. One of the goals was to monitor the nesting condition of the box turtles. And the second goal was to monitor the conditions in which they overwinter. The first one is a little more. I'm sorry, what is that about the box? Uh -huh. So a box uh, contains many sensors. A box is, yeah. And you'll see that, I guess, when you, when you get. Uh, so let me go into a little bit of detail on the first goal, uh, which is the monitoring of nesting conditions. Now, this is interesting because these specific turtles, they don't have a sex chromosome. So the sex of the turtle is decided completely on the basis of the nesting conditions. And uh, studies have shown that a difference of a few degrees here or there can be the difference between a male and a female turtle. So what we did was we went and deployed our sensors. And this is a high-level map of both the experiments. The one in red uh, is the, are the turtle nest locations. And the one in blue are the locations where the turtles were found over winter. So only one of these uh, uh, gave us a successful turtle hatching. So the other ones actually did not hatch. But this gives us some clues as to what the conditions were and why this happened. 
So after uh, doing a bunch of early deployments, we sort of asked ourselves, OK, there's a lot of important stuff that needs to be learned, uh, but what are those lessons? So let me begin by elaborating some of the schema lessons. Uh, one of the most important lessons that we learn is obviously hardware can fail. We all know this, uh, but what is important is that the schema should be flexible enough to deal with these failures from a science point of view. So to be specific, uh, here's a picture that I showed you in the previous slide. And uh, this particular experiment uh, finished earlier than this experiment. And then what, uh, what happened was one of these boxes actually failed. Uh, and we didn't have enough boxes on site, so what we had to do is we had to replace this box with this box. And now that was a little bit of a problem from our schema point of view because data was related to our hardware from our, in our previous schema. It was not related to the location. And uh, that doesn't make sense for a scientist because they're only interested in data at a specific locations, not which hardware it's coming from. So the next important lesson we learned was that sensors can be pretty heterogeneous within a specific deployment. You might have different set types of sensors at different locations. For example, one of the locations might have a CO2 sensor. The others may not, and so on and so forth. Uh, not only that, across different deployments, the science goals may be different. So the choice of sensors are governed by that. So there's a lot of heterogeneity in the choice of sensors. So your schemas need to be flexible in order to deal with it. And finally, ultimately, uh, there is this uh, notion that scientists would really like to mix and match. And basically, they would like to correlate data across deployments, across sensors, without having to worry about what type of hardware it is, what type of deployment it is, where it's coming from. So those are some of the key schema lessons that we had to keep in mind. OK, so moving from schema to the data, uh, of course, again, I'm stating the obvious. Metadata is important, but I just kind of like to give you a practical example of where this kind of bit is in the wrong place. Uh, so here is an example of soil temperature for a period of around two weeks. Uh, and this is soil temperature f at the same location, but at two different depths. And uh, what happened was we were not careful enough to record which depth this was at. And so obviously they're strongly correlated, but one is warmer than the other, and we had a pretty heated argument within the soil ecologists as to which one is which. And we could have avoided all of that if we had just recorded which depths it was at. Okay, then the second one, which is very popular in our group, is a case where we found that one of our boxes antenna was chewed. Uh, we believe it's a squirrel. Uh, and what was really interesting was that this didn't actually damage the antenna. The antenna was fine, but it created a huge hole in, in our sensor. And what happened was when the next big rain event came, that's the big rain event, the boss moisture went up, and that screwed up all our electronics. So, OK, so having said all of that, uh, it was important for us to sort of capture all of these lessons learned into one unified architecture. So the two key things we learned is that every deployment, there are two things. One, uh, the, some of the things are deployment specific, uh, and some of the things are deployment independent. So this kind of paved the way for a two-phase loading approach. The first phase was the staging phase, which contained all the metadata and, and captured some of the deployment specific tasks. And the second phase was the science phase, which was tailored to the needs of the scientists, which is hardware agnostic and sort of deployment agnostics. And this sort of captures uh, what Deb has also been talking about, that computer scientists tend to think of, tend to care about these details about deployments and hardware and metadata and all that. But scientists might be more interested in the actual data. You know, where is this data coming from? What is the location? What is its accuracy? Not specifically which hardware it used. So that was all about the old. I'm going to talk a little bit about our current set of deployments. Uh, so after learning all of that, we started uh, deploying the next generation of sensors, uh, and we went back to our favorite location. This is Olin Hall at Johns Hopkins campus, and these are uh, some of our boxes. There are 19 of them. Uh, from the soil ecology point of view, they were interested in, again, studying the spatial variation aspects of the ecosystems. Uh, what, but what this deployment did for the computer scientists, what is it allowed us to test for multiple hardware replacements. So in the beginning phases, there were a lot of failures, our code broke, so we had to replace a lot of boxes. And this kind of stress tested our schema uh, just so that it can capture all those replacements. OK, so that was one of the two parallel deployments. Our second parallel deployment, which is also running for around almost five months, 
is uh, co-located near a flux tower. And uh, this is scientifically a little more interesting because uh, we have a new addition to our uh, sensor repertoire. There's a soil CO2 sensor. And uh, there are three locations where soil CO2 is being measured, right near where the flux tower is. Uh, so, so this is really cool for soil ecologists because they can now study the exchange of CO2 between the air temperature, sorry, between air and between soil. But this was cool for us because we could test our schema in terms of how it deals with different flex sensor types uh, and different heterogeneity within the sensors themselves. So all this is cool. And this is the, the overall architecture that uh, we came up with. And uh, basically, I'll walk you through the end-to-end -end movement of data. So if you, the first stage is data collection, which is in a very raw stage. And uh, basically, what happens is each deployment each base station collects all the data that these sensors are gathering, and then it pushes it to a web server. And uh, this happens very periodically because now we're interested in monitoring their health in a much more frequent manner. So this happens every six hours, and also each uh, device records a journal of its actions. So it keeps a log of everything it did within that past six hours. The next phase is the two-phase loading, which can further be broken down into two, uh, two stages. One is the stage, uh, stage part of the database, which basically captures all this meta information uh, that I talked about previously. And the second part is the science, science database. So you'll notice that each deployment has its own staging phase. So for example, this deployment will have one database, stage database for itself. Uh, but finally, there is one science database. And I'll talk a little bit about the benefits of doing that. So uh, what this does is basically allows us to get very fine detailed information about how every component of our system is doing. And periodically, health reports are generated that help us in monitoring the health activity of each component. So I'll talk a little bit, little bit about the two-phase loading and the health monitoring aspect of this system. OK. so. To summarize again, what the stage database does is that it's the first entry where all the data is ingested in the form of raw packets. And also, uh, it maintains a journal of all the actions that the mode has been doing so far. Each download acts as a version number, so the origins of the data can be traced back to which download we were talking about. And if the downloads are corrupted, we can undo this. And this sort of design philosophy comes from having Alex's background in Sky Server, where they realized downloads can be corrupted and you need to undo these things. And finally, uh, the stage database also contains all the tracking information. So what hardware is placed at what location and what is its significance? Now, this was important because uh, unless this is in place, we will not allow the processing to go on further. So this kind of acts as an integrity constraint and avoids those arguments of which sensor was at what depth and so on. So basically, what this ensured is that while we deploy these things, we have to have to record them. Otherwise, no for processing will go on any further. So just to drill down a little more, uh, as I was talking earlier, we also maintain this journal, which records detailed information of the actions that each mode takes. So this is the kind of thing that computer scientists get excited about. What are the number of retransmissions? What are the download paths, the reboot count, et cetera? Let me just give you a quick example. Uh, this, in this specific example, uh, on the x-axis, you have time. And uh, this is a map of when each box was lost contacted by the gateway. So you can see that some of them have been running on their own and have not been able to talk to the gateway, whereas some had a break but then eventually recovered. So this sort of information is pretty useful. The next thing I'd like to talk about is timestamp reconstruction. This is again done by the stage database. This is a, a task that is kind of specific to sensor networks. Uh, because sensor networks run on a battery and they're operating on a fixed power budget, each uh, clock synchronization becomes a very expensive task. So what typically happens is that each device or this mode runs a logical clock of its own, and then measurements are timestamped using this logical clock. And then they're converted to global timestamps, so the universal timestamp, uh, using a process of postmortem timestamp reconstruction. And so the logical clock and the global clock are related by a simple linear relationship, where alpha is the clock skew and beta is your starting time. So what happens is, periodically, the gateway will collect samples as to what its current local clock is and what is the current global clock. And then after it collects these pairs, 
it will fit for this alpha and beta parameters. So just to sort of describe this in a more convenient fashion, here's a, a, a graph of logical clock versus the Unix timestamp. So that's the logical clock. And then the slope represents the clock skew. Uh, beta represents the start time. And then these represents the point where the anchor points or the sampling of these pairs takes place. OK, so this is good in theory. But what happens in practice is that modes tend to reboot. And this is because of shorts due to moisture or hardware or bugs or software bugs. And so when they reboot, the logical clock gets reset. And so you see this sawtooth kind of pattern uh, where time will obviously increase, but logical clock gets reset. So when this happens, you need to re-estimate alpha and beta. And this is kind of tricky for reasons I won't go into, but uh, you basically have to map anchor points to specific segments. And this is, uh, this is all done by the stage database and is not sort of, is kind of hidden to all the other processing. So what then ha has to happen is that you need to come up with new fits for, for these new segments. Now, eventually, sometimes these guys, as I was showing you earlier, they may not be able to talk to the base station at all. So in that case, you might not be able to sample anchor points at all. So that's, that's a tricky situation. So these guys are collecting data, but data is only in logical clocks. How do you convert them to global clocks? So I won't get into the details, but Alex, uh, our resident astronomer, came up with a pretty clever idea of correlating the light series with the annual patterns of the sun for specific latitude. So if you're more interested, I would encourage you to read this paper. Uh, it's available on our website. Uh, but I won't go into the specifics of it right now. OK, so all of that was part of the stage database. I'm going to talk a little bit of the benefits of having a unified science database now. Uh, the first thing of what I talked about was a location-centric database. So every time series is specified with a location and a type, not with hardware. So just to give you a quick example, this is a plot of uh, daily air temperature for a period of two months. And what actually happened was that we had two box replacements here, but that's kind of transparent to the scientist. So all he cares about is what is the time series for that location for this specific period. Moreover, uh, a unified science database allows you to correlate data across multiple deployments, multiple types at different scales, so you can mix and match. So this is an example where CO2 at two different depths is correlated with moisture. And I'm not an environmental scientist, so I won't pretend like I know this, but this is just something I had up there. So I'm getting to the last, last bit of my talk. Uh, just to summarize, uh, I talked a little bit about uh, the need for a two-stage loading approach, where the first stage is deployment-specific, and the second stage is deployment-independent. Uh, I talked about the need for having early detection of failures. So far, we've replaced 19 boxes between both these two long deployments. Uh, 16 sensors, and what that has meant is that has increased our data yield. Now, again, what I mean by data yield is the fraction of the usable data or the data that is used by the scientists. So all of that implies that the scientists are happy, so we are happy. So finally, I'd like to leave you with a, a picture of SenseWeb, which I know we are going to hear about soon in this, uh, in this session. So this is data that came from our turtle uh, experiment. And uh, that is the same sort of locations that I showed you earlier. So if you go to SenseWeb and search for Mount Calvert, you'll be able to see all of that using SenseWeb. So that brings me to the end of my talk. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I didn't talk about calibration. That's a good point. Uh, Basically, each sensor has its own calibration curve. And so that gets handled at the science level. But I sort of didn't talk about it. Yeah, I guess I didn't talk about it. Because I wanted to stress more on the two-phase loading approach uh, in terms of how to handle all the different aspects of the sensor deployments. But in specific, if there was a question that I can attack about the uh, calibration. OK, let me ask you about one of the curves you had up there. OK, sure. This one? How do you have continuous data in the box replacements? Well, so the box replacements happen seamlessly, right? So if you. So it wasn't due to failure. 
Okay, so if you know that it's going to, like, so if the moisture is up to like 90, 95%, you know it's going to fail pretty soon. So you make sure you just replace it without uh, doing any, without losing any time during which you have no data. Okay, so I've almost never seen a Moses one that's in that much continuous data. Yeah, so this thing, so we download this stuff every six hours, and every six hours there's an automated report that's generated, and so we look at it and we know the health of each component. So that's how we're able to replace it. Of course, I'm showing you a really nice slide. There are times when stuff has been missing, but it's at max six hours. Yes, please. Um, when you concentrate on location, uh -huh. um, aren't you forgetting or are you abandoning information about uh, sensor quality, uh, let us say, the provenance data? Uh -huh. That's, that's a good question. So maybe I didn't make my point quite clear enough, but uh, the beauty of having this two-phase loading is that all of that can be captured in the first phase, the staging phase. So you can keep all the provenance data of what type of sensor it is. Are you calibrating at this stage, and then you can account for it? No, we don't calibrate it at that stage. The calibration curve is in the science phase, but all the provenance data is in the staging phase. So each sensor type will have its curve. So it's independent, it just knows what the curve is. It doesn't need to know which sensor it is. As long as it knows the curve, it can calibrate it. But when it goes to the science database, it also informs, hi, I am the sensor. It doesn't, it doesn't. Oh. Yeah, it just needs to know what the calibration curve is and what type oh, it is. Okay. Yeah. Is that, does that make it clear? Or? We'll talk about it. OK, OK. <laughs> so maybe one more question? Uh -huh. Uh huh. Uh, so okay, the point I was trying to make was uh, they're happy if there's data continuity. They not they don't need to be bothered that okay we change this box with this ID with this box with this ID. It's low level details and they don't need to worry about it. But we as scientists or computer scientists need to worry about it because we actually do maintain all that metadata to know what's going on, what boxes we have and networking what went wrong, you know, whether it was this component or that component. But they don't need to know. Right, right, exactly. 